Welcome into Live Now from Fox. I'm your host, Gabrielle Amato, live now from our Orlando studios. And just a couple of minutes ago, we did get a live update from a NATO headquarters in Brussels. We heard from NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg. Uh, he gave the latest update uh, after a meeting of the foreign minister. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was part of that meeting. And we do want to get instant reaction from an expert, a counterinsurgency expert and former intelligence officer, Michael Pregent. Uh, he joins us live right now. Michael, uh, thank you so very much for the time. I do want to bring you in. Um, and we'll begin really with the big news of the day. We all woke up uh, this morning to news that the Zap Zaporizhia nuclear plant uh, is now under Russian occupation uh, and that it was actually shelled overnight. A fire broke out. When you heard this news, what was your instant reaction? Uh, my instant reaction was uh who who bombs a nuclear facility why, why would a country do that and uh it's very dangerous uh right now the iea is saying that the, it looks like the six reactors were not hit which is great and uh but still you who who shells a a nuclear reactor And that oh, really is a natural now. reaction here. Okay. Yeah, we, we got the audio issues all figured out. That is the natural reaction. I mean, it, this conflict really reached a level that many thought it would not reach overnight. Um, my next question to you, was this an accident or is this all part of the Russian strategy to cut off Ukraine's um, energy supply? I, I mean, what do you think is happening here? Accident or part of the plan? P part of the plan and reckless uh, would be my, my description of this. The, the Russians want to shut down the internet, they want to shut down power. The Ukrainians have a lot of friends that have been countering Russian cyber attacks, that have been keeping the internet going. And uh, this is an effort by the Russians to actually take out a nuclear power plant in order to shut the lights off. And so, Continuing this conversation about, you know, being part of the plan or an accident, what do you make of where Russia currently stands on day nine of their operation? I mean, let's not forget that a couple of weeks ago when intelligence was coming out about this in potential invasion at the time, uh, many suggested that Kiev would fall within 72 hours. Michael, we are now on day nine. Uh, we just from, heard from Jan Stoltenberg. He says that Putin gravely underestimated Ukrainian forces. Is that your take on this situation as well? I think the West and Europe bravely underestimated Zelensky. Remember, uh, the Biden administration was trying to get Zelensky out of Ukraine. Had he left, it may have been 72 hours before the Russians uh, got to Kyiv. They weren't able to do that. Uh, Zelensky has stayed. His forces are fighting. There is a, an insurgency in parallel with the uh, Ukrainian military that is taking on this Russian force that is more capable, has more numbers, but the, the morale within the troops, all of that is affecting this operation. And the morale on the Ukrainian side is, 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 is incredible. It really is incredible. And it's something that we've been bringing to our viewers for quite a few days now. Um, the French President Macron, he spoke to Putin on the phone yesterday, a 90 minute conversation. And Putin says the worst is yet to come. When you hear statements like that, what are you imagining? Well, I mean, if, if you look at what's happened to Putin right now, um, he's going to be brought up for war crimes. He's going to be punished for what he did in Syria, what he did in Chechnya, what he's doing now in Ukraine. So there is no going back to normal for, for Putin. So when I hear language like it's only going to get worse, it sounds like he's all in. And the message that he's heard so far from the West is you can do this to non-NATO countries. But if you do it to a NATO country, then we're going to do something about it. So he hears, I can use the threat of nuclear war and invade any country that's not aligned with NATO. But if I go after Latvia, Lithuania, or Estonia, then NATO's going to do something. And I think he still doesn't believe NATO's going to do anything if he moves on a Baltic state that's a member of NATO. And he's calculating that. He's a very dangerous man right now. And we saw an oligarch actually put a uh, bounty uh, on Putin, not to kill him, but to have somebody arrest him. 
and you know we've heard Senator Graham say the, say the same thing. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, you know, Putin's moving into Ukraine, killing civilians, and uh, it's not out of bounds to to have some Russian general inside say enough. The, the Russian people are saying enough. They're protesting on the streets, and a man that says it's only going to get worse after bombing a nuclear plant, after killing civilians, after invading a sovereign country, uh, you have to take him at his word, and it's about time we, we do something about it. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. The UN did just vote to um, begin investigating Russia for these potential um, war crimes. That vote did just happen this morning. So you're spot on with that. You spoke about NATO, and that's where I want to go next because we did just get the latest update from Jan Stoltenberg. Uh, and you're spot on with your assessment. He has said, we will provide military support to Ukraine, but we will not be part of the conflict. When Putin hears hit this, is he just motivated to continue on with his efforts in Ukraine? Because NATO is saying we are not going to get involved. He's hearing that NATO has basically said, OK, you can take Ukraine, but don't take anything else. And that doesn't work with Putin. Remember, when we talked a week and a half ago, it was only about those two breakaway republics in the Donbass region. And I said then, you know, Putin's like a cancer. Once he gets to those lymph nodes, those two breakaway republics, he's going to keep going. Once he takes Ukraine, he, he's going to look at uh, he's going to look at Moldova. He's going to look at Georgia. He's going to look at the countries that he can take that aren't NATO aligned that border Russia. And NATO needs to send a, a stronger message. I, I, I do believe NATO and the international community should have a problem with Putin invading any sovereign country, and that it shouldn't be an alliance that keeps that country from being consumed by Putin. It should be an alliance that says this isn't going to happen. And Putin's going to, looks like he's doing what he did in Syria at this point. He's using banned weapons to kill civilians, cluster bombs. Uh, we're hearing that the uh, you know thermobaric bomb is, is getting ready to be used. We've seen the launchers at the tactical level. And uh, it's very concerning. Uh, his back is, is against the wall. There is no going back to normal after this. He will be charged for war crimes. What is this man capable of? Yeah, and that is the question. What is he capable of and what could potentially be next? You talk about um, no going back. When we look at moving forward and, and physically moving forward, I want to talk about that 40-mile convoy that we have been monitoring for days that has essentially stalled. Uh, can you explain how this has happened uh, and what this means and how this could potentially anger Putin to perhaps be even more aggressive now? Well, it's, it's, it's almost a sitting duck, right? Uh, if this convoy was threatening, you know, if we, were to, if we were to believe what NATO is saying, if this convoy was in a NATO country, it would be destroyed. But this convoy is sitting there. It's about 15 miles outside of Kiev. It has everything in it needed to take Kiev to level Kiev. It has artillery. Uh, the Russians operate this way, core artillery groups, division artillery groups, and brigade artillery groups. And they could just lay waste to Kiev. But that would be a loss. Uh, he's trying to encircle Kiev. It's a sitting duck out there. One of the biggest disappointments of the last week were, were those uh, Ukrainian pilots going to Poland to pick up MiGs and SU-25s or 24s and to take them back to destroy this convoy. And NATO put pressure on Poland to say no. The United States put pressure on Poland to say no to the transfer of those aircraft, those air-to-ground attack aircraft that were ready to be given to the Ukrainian pilots who are trained to fly these things to go in and decimate this convoy. And NATO said no. And we, when we speak about potentially like the strategy that Russia is currently um, implementing on the ground in Ukraine, we see this convoy, but we're also seeing, especially over the past 48 hours, Michael, really heavy fighting to the south of Ukraine. And it's no coincidence that those are major port cities, Odessa, Mariupol. Can you explain to our viewers why Putin is hitting here and hitting here hard? He's he's shutting down all of the uh, logistical support lines. He's shutting down the ports so that uh, countries that want to support Ukraine cannot. He's, he's shutting down the ports that would be providing food, water, equipment. Um, and he, and he's, he's focusing on those ports on the Black Sea. The majority of the supplies that are now coming into Ukraine are from Romania and Poland. 
he can't shut those two down. Uh, both are NATO countries. So he's focusing on what isolates and cuts off Ukraine from basic supplies, uh, food and water, and he's, he means to starve these capital cities and force them to surrender. This is the same tactic he used in Syria. They would surround a city, they wouldn't let anything into it. Uh, they would they would wait till like day four or five when the population was starving, uh, when it was didn't have water, and then they would still conduct artillery strikes and still put pressure on the leadership to abandon their weapons and allow the Russians to come in. And then they would simply go and kill the military aged males that were in the city. And speaking about supplies, we're seeing already at those cities, Odessa, Mariupol, running out of basic needs. Uh, and just like you said, no corridors to get them in. Speaking of these corridors, just yesterday, uh, the Russian and Ukrainian delegations did sit for round two of talks. There was no ceasefire agreement, uh, but they did uh, agree allegedly on human um, on corridors to get humans out and, of course, bring supplies in. Do you think that there is ever going to be a meeting where these two sides agree to a ceasefire? And moreover, how essential are these types of corridors? Well, the corridors are very important. Um, and Russia has never really honored honoring these corridors. Uh, the Russian forces didn't honor these corridors in Syria. Uh, I don't expect them to honor them now. Uh, this is a way for, for Putin to be able to say, listen, we're there to put down this, this Nazi regime in Ukraine. We are providing humanitarian aid to these places. It's all talk. He's never honored a ceasefire, and he's never honored a protected uh, human uh, rights or, or supply corridor into these cities. He's never honored it, and I wouldn't expect him to now. Yeah, it is something, and I'm trying to get the video up there so everyone can see the, really the humanitarian uh, disaster that is unfolding. Do you expect this humanitarian crisis to get worse, Michael? UN already confirming we've reached one million refugees in just a week. Uh, and not only do you expect it to get worse, but what can the world and what should the United States be doing uh, to help? Well, it's going to get worse. Uh, food's going to start running out. Uh, the majority of the supplies are coming in from Poland. That has to stay open. The UN and the US should say, listen, anything we do in Ukraine, uh, this is the one thing we are gonna do is we're gonna protect these ground and air routes, bringing in food to a starving population. And, uh, you know, NATO's supposed to talk today about looking into a no-fly zone. That needs to happen. We can't say that Putin can do this because it's a non-NATO country and we don't wanna risk nuclear war. And in the same sentence say, that if he goes into Lithuania, Latvia or Estonia, we're gonna to go to war. Putin has nothing to lose at this point. Uh, he, I, I, think he's, I think he's bluffing. I think he knows that if he uses this bravado language about a nuclear reaction, if the United States protects, protects an air corridor, establishes a no-fly zone, provides aircraft to Ukrainian pilots to kill this convoy, that he's going to go resort to a, a nuclear response uh, I, I don't think his generals would allow him to do that. But again, this is a crazy man surrounding himself with yes men. And he may look at simply securing a ground route or an air route to, to do like a Berlin blockade style uh, you know, resupply of civilians um, as, as, as provocative as, as a increase in the U.S. position in Ukraine. And he's counting on us not doing anything. And so far, he's right. You speak about the yes men. I want to get to those in just a couple of minutes, but I want to stick with the no fly zone because we just heard Jan Stoltenberg once again say that a no fly zone is just simply not an option for NATO. But what you're outlining is pretty much for our viewers to understand it's a chess game. It's just whoever makes the first move. NATO says it will get involved if Russia attacks a NATO country. Ukraine is not a NATO country, so NATO will not get involved first. It really is, Michael, whoever is going to make the first move. It is, and uh, the good thing about Ukraine is that Putin didn't see this coming. He didn't expect this type of resistance. His soldiers didn't expect this type of resistance. He just lost a key general on the battlefield today who didn't expect this kind of resistance. And now, instead of moving in and, and, and looking like a professional military, now they're simply using these banned weapons, banned artillery, banned rockets and missiles to punish a civilian population. 
um, if he is able to establish a puppet government in Ukraine, the insurgency will push back. The insurgency will be there for a while. Siri keeps listening to our conversation. The insurgency will, will, will be there and it will bloody uh, this puppet government that's in place. But he's looking at Moldova. If you look at the Belarus president, he, on his map, he had Moldova there. Uh, there. There's, to your point about the chess piece, uh, Gabriel, he's, he's looking at other moves and we need to be ahead of him. And right now we're saying you can take all of these moves until you put us into check or checkmate, then we'll do something. Yeah, that does appear to be how this is all unfolding. And you're right, Belarus, definitely a, a big piece to this puzzle uh, and a big assistance for Russia, for Vladimir Putin, one of the very few, if any, direct allies that he currently has in a moment where he's been very isolated uh, from the world and from world leaders. Um, when speaking about Putin and this isolation, obviously the world's approach to sanctions have been heavily targeted towards the oligarchs the money men. What do you make of this approach? And do you think that we will get to a point where these oligarchs, his very close friends, the people who has his ears are going to say enough is enough because my yachts, my family is now being impacted. My wealth is gone. Is that the strategy? But do you think it's actually going to come to fruition? Well, we, we've seen several oligarchs. One sold a, a football team in Europe uh, in order to donate the money from the selling of that team to the Ukrainian people. I don't know whether that was a sincere gesture or not, but it did impact this oligarch's control over a European soccer team. And we saw another oligarch offer a, a bounty to have Putin arrested. Um, we talked about this last week. You need to punish Putin's inner circle. You need to take away Putin's gas and oil. And we do not need to reward Iran with the nuclear deal that is simply going to be a bypass mechanism for Russia to sell Iran's oil. Uh, Iran owes Russia a lot of money. Uh, Russia's invested in Iran this whole time. So they're going to buy advanced weapons, advanced air defense systems. Um, right now, the United States needs to look at anything Putin touches and threaten it with secondary sanctions. You know, Nancy Pelosi, Senator Manchin, um, majority of, of Republicans and Democrats want to see us stop importing Russian oil. It's the White House that continues to resist. We need to basically offset Russia's uh, supply on the oil market, shut, shut them down, shut down Iran's oil exports and have our allies increase theirs. Now, I know our allies are hesitant because we just haven't been there for them. We haven't been there for Saudi Arabia, the UAE when they're being attacked by the Houthis. We haven't been there with Israel, and that's why you see these countries abstaining from condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine, traditional American allies, because we're not backing them up. What the U.S. is doing, Michael, is sending them weapons. Uh, we just heard that a bunch of Stinger weapons were sent over. Can you explain to uh, our viewers who perhaps are not very familiar with this type of language and, and weaponry, um, what the U.S. Sure. has supplied Ukraine with, and if this is really helpful it absolutely is it's so helpful to the ukrainian military and the resistance to come that if we had faced stingers and javelins in iraq or afghanistan we would have been bloodied so bad we would have had to exit within six months and we would never know the term forever war uh, the stinger shoots down advanced russian aircraft the javelin kills advanced russian armor uh, they're, they're portable, two to three man teams. You can hide in buildings, you can hide in the woods, you can move around. It's very hard to find them, but they're very effective. They're very lethal. And, you know, people say hearts and prayers. I like to say stingers and javelins. That's certainly one way to put it. I won't say the same because I'm not nearly as uh, as well versed in that area as you, but I trust your input, Michael. Um, so they are sending weaponry that are extremely useful to Ukrainians. That is something positive that the U.S. is doing. What would you like to see the West do more of? Uh, I know you said a no-fly zone. It, that seems to be an option that is just not on the table right now for NATO. But what realistically can uh, be done to help Ukraine on day nine? It, it's just unbelievable. We're into week two of this invasion. I think uh, the, the immediate transfer of air-to-ground attack aircraft 
staged them in Poland, have Ukrainian pilots come over, they've already been trained on these aircraft, and then have them use it. It's not a direct involvement of the West or NATO. It's simply the arms transfer to a sovereign country under attack by the Russians. I'd like to see that. Um, it's too late to get, you know, Patriot battery systems in there or other systems like that. The way to go is to have these, these portable shoulder fired anti-aircraft weapons like the Stinger and their equivalents. Uh, the Ukrainian military has been very effective using Turkish drones to attack Russian armor and Turkish anti-tank weapons. Uh, things like that, that needs to continue to flow in. We need to keep the internet up, we need to keep the power going, and we need to be able to conduct cyber attacks and then deny that we did them. A cheeky answer there, Michael, but you're spot on. Ukraine does need all of the assistance that it can get. Um, as we look ahead to what people, our viewers, can expect in coming days, what do you expect? Obviously, it's very difficult, impossible to predict uh, what Putin has planned uh, because just overnight, the world was shocked by that uh, shelling of the nuclear power plant, uh, which is now, of course, OK. But what do you expect to see uh, based on your experience in the coming days? Well, we, we've seen Putin leveling Ukrainian towns, you know, Kharkiv, um, Kharkiv, and he's moving in on Kyiv now. The closer the Russians get to Kyiv, the more danger Zelensky is in. Uh, Zelensky needs to stay alive. The West needs to do everything they can to keep him alive. Uh, I, I don't, I wouldn't, um, I would suggest that we put in our own uh, personal security detachments, you know, ununiformed in there to help this guy. We're providing him intel on threats to his life. Zelensky needs to stay alive. His inner circle needs to stay alive. I mean, we saw the, the Ukrainian parliament, uh, you know, sing their national anthem under the threat of being bombed. And things like that should move countries. It should change minds to do something now. Uh, we are watching in real time in this modern era, 24 seven social media and videos of war crimes, of atrocities, of a, of, a, of a leader, of a leader using banned weapons to kill civilians. And the world needs to care because Ukrainians are, are, are standing up. We didn't think they would. We didn't think Zelensky would. And the rest of the world is watching and our adversary is going to take advantage of a weak White House. Our adversaries are going to take advantage of a weak NATO. Uh, I want Zelensky to hold out. I want him to stay alive. I want us to help out. Uh, he's got about 10 days before this becomes very critical uh, for his, uh, his inner circle's uh, survival. And the United States needs to do everything it can, along with NATO, to keep him alive. Yeah, and the United States has offered to remove him from the country, uh, but President Zelensky is staying strong. He does not want to leave. He really is uh, a man who has moved not only a country, but a world. We try and bring his updates to our viewers live, raw, and unfiltered every chance we get. Michael Pregent, thank you so much once again for all of the insight. Um, unfortunately, we are on day nine, uh, and I do think that we'll be touching base in coming days as this story does evolve. Can I Thanks say again. one more thing? Can I yes. say one more thing? Had, had Zelensky had left... Russia would already be, Putin would already be in Kyiv. So it's good that Zelensky his, said no to that offer. His impact had that big uh, of a reaction in the country. Really. Thank really you big. so much, Gabriel. Thank you as well. Yeah.